Good morning, good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Yes, as Tina said, come back. Join us. We got food, pickleball. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, and just a great chance to build relationships and, and connect. That's what I love about summertime here is we can just kind of hang out and get to know each other and um, build relationships. So, whoa, hey, uh, welcome to you. Could you eject this lady? Um, <laughs> But today we're going to start a brand new sermon series that uh, is going to go through the month of June. So one of the, uh, our goals and hopes through the month of June is that we as a church look outward to the community around us and figure out ways how to serve the community, how to bless people. So we have our love week in June, which will be the end of June, where for a whole week we're trying to schedule activities to get into our community and to serve. Um, And today we're going to start a new sermon series called The Art of Neighboring, because we also want to talk about how can we just see the opportunities that are right around us every single day to love the people God has near us. So we're going to talk through that, but before we do, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to learn and to grow and uh, and to connect to you. Father, I pray that you would teach us your wisdom, Lord, that we could love you in a deeper way this summer. Father, I pray our, our love for you, our delight in you could just grow to a new level. And I pray, Father, that would, it would help us to love the people around us in better ways. So grant us this grace, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this, uh, this winter time, right around Christmas time, I, I tweaked my back uh, pretty bad. And I've kind of have done this for several years. And so normally, like, I have, like, a good protocol to, like, get it back into shape. But it just wouldn't really heal, you know? And so for for months, it's been bothering me, and, uh, and some might say I'm getting older. I don't think, you know, I don't think that's it. <laughs> uh, I, it's just a, a crazy thing. And so finally, my doctor was like, hey, you need to go to physical therapy. So finally, I did. Last week, I went for my first session, and the therapist was like, you know, doing all these different tests to see what was going on and where the mobility was and stuff, and and kind of after doing all that, she was like, she's like, you are insanely inflexible. <laughs> and I was like, do you mean that like personally or physically? Because just want to be clear here. And, and she's like, yeah, you're literally like one of the, the most inflexible patients that, that I've had. Um, and I was like, well, thanks. I always like to be in the top, you know, whatever. <laughs> Uh, so she's like, she's like, if you just honestly like focus on stretching like your hamstrings and a couple other things, she's like, it's going to go a long way for you because I think all that tightness is really keeping you in a bad spot. And I was like, well, honestly, that's really good news because that's kind of an easier fix. You know, I can do that. I hate stretching. Obviously, I haven't practiced it my whole life. But I can do that. If that's what it takes to feel a little bit better, you know, I'm at that point where, where I'm in for that. And it was, it was a very simple solution. And I think sometimes in life, when there seems to be really, really complicated problems in our lives or in the world, sometimes the solution isn't always complicated. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because I think most of us would agree, we would look at the world and say, you know, the world could be better. Amen? That it could be better. Uh, and pretty much everyone agrees with that. But then when we try to think about how to make it better, we can sort of get lost in that question. We can get lost in trying to figure it out. And what we're going to talk about through the month of June is what Jesus calls us to do as his followers. Which he says, you have, you have two overriding priorities in your life. Number one is to love God. And number two is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And what I want to argue in this series is that if we can grow in those two things, those two priorities, 
it, it will inevitably make the world around us better. That what, what Jesus calls us to do is really a simple solution, but it can go really, really far in making our homes and our communities better places. Now, there's this great book called The Art of Neighboring, and uh, if you're interested in this, you could check it out, and it's a really good read. And I'm going to kind of use some ideas from this to give us some challenges and applications. But in the book, the, it's written by two pastors, and they're from the Denver area. And they were at this citywide meeting with all the different pastors in Denver and the mayor. And the mayor started talking about all these different problems in the community. You know, problems with youth and problems with... Um, you know, the disrepair of different places. And he just had this, this huge list of problems. And he said, now, if the government tries to solve all these problems, he said, it's not going to go well because it's going to be too costly. It's going to be too complicated. He said, what our community really needs is to learn how to be good neighbors to each other. And this was to this group of pastors. And so they heard that. And these two guys, they just kind of walked out with their heads hanging low because they said, well, isn't that the very thing Jesus asked us to do? Love our neighbor as ourselves. And here's the mayor of the city asking a group of pastors, hey, could you help us do that? And they just kind of realized at that moment that that's what we should be doing all along. And if we do that, it makes a huge difference. So that's what we're going to talk about for this month. And we're going to begin by looking at Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to begin at verse 25 today. And the next two weeks, we're going to look at, at this passage. But here's how it begins. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, to put Jesus to the test. Now, when you hear lawyer here, don't think of a modern day lawyer. This lawyer would have been someone who was an expert in Old Testament law. So they'd be more like a Bible scholar today or a theologian. And this guy stands up and you, we see his motives. He wants to test Jesus. So he's not asking a sincere question. He's trying to trap Jesus. And at this point in Jesus's ministry, Jesus was getting this reputation for hanging out with the wrong people, tax collectors and sinners. And so for the people like this lawyer, it was guilt by association. And so they were like, all right, we, we know Jesus can't be the real deal because if he was, he would not be able to stand the presence of these people and he certainly wouldn't welcome them. And so they're like, we're, we're gonna expose them here. So, so this is what's behind this question. He says, so teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do? And then Jesus said to him, now I love this, if you get a question and you are suspicious of the motives, you just ask another question in response. I love that method. What, you know, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? I use that all the time. I learned it from Jesus. Uh, he said to him, what, what is written in the law? How, how do you read it? So he says, all right, how do you inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, well, you tell me. You're the law expert. Again, you're the Old Testament law expert. What, what do you think? How do you understand it? And he answered him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is actually a great answer. And the reason this is a great answer is because if we do these two things, it, it covers everything. See, by loving God with the fullness of our being, then all the, the different ways I could go off the path, they're not going to happen. If I constantly love my neighbor as myself, I'm not going to steal from them because I wouldn't want them to steal from me. I'm not going to slander them because I wouldn't want them to slander me. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, treat them in a really mean way because I wouldn't want them to treat me that way. And so by focusing on these things, everything else is covered. And so this, in a sense, is the perfect summary 
of the way of life that God has for each of us. And then it goes on, and Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, Jesus is playing into this game, this guy's game a little bit. Now, don't, don't hear Jesus saying that, this, that if we do these things perfectly, then we will be saved, and God will forgive our sins, and God will accept us uh, into his presence, and all that kind of thing. That is built on what Christ has done for us. But what this is about is about the life that God calls us to live. And many times people refer to this as the, uh, you know, the great commandments or the golden rule. Have you ever heard of that? The golden rule. And what's interesting about that is that people inside and outside of the Christian faith usually all say, if we just lived by the golden rule, the world would be a better place. And they're referring to this. They're referring to love your neighbor as yourself. But the golden rule, notice, it doesn't begin with our neighbor. It begins with God. And that's what often gets passed over. That Jesus says, no, first... I need a growing love for God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind. And then comes the neighbor part. I need to grow in my love for God first before I'm able to grow in my love for others. And today that's what I want to focus on. I want to talk about how we can grow in our love for God. See, here's the truth. If you and I develop a bigger heart for God, it will translate into us loving people in our lives in a better way. These are interconnected. But love for God changes how I relate and love other people. So here's the big idea today. Better neighboring begins with a greater love for God. If I'm struggling to love the people in my life, then here's the beginning point. Begin with trying to grow your love for God. Now let's talk about these two loves here real quick. Jesus says, this man answered correctly. Loving God and loving others is meant to be the focus of our lives. And here's what I believe. When you and I, when we neglect that focus, when we abandon those priorities, then our life becomes misaligned and increasingly more terrible. See, you you were created to do this. I know in our world we're bombarded with the message that we were created without a purpose, that we were created just randomly, that we're all, you know, biological accidents. But Jesus says something that is entirely different than that. That you were created for God to love God and to love other people. And when you try to use and live your life outside of what you were created for, it doesn't work that well. And most things, when you try to use them outside of their intended purpose, it doesn't work that well. My girls were in the garage the other day and they, and they found a stud finder, you know, and, uh, and so they, they thought it was so cool because it beeps, it makes noise, it has a little laser thing on it. And, uh, and so, of course, the first thing that I did was took it from them and rubbed it across me <laughs> and said, yes, girls, this works. Because <laughs> as a guy and as a dad, you're required to do that. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anybody? So, and then once I did that, I gave it back to them. <laughs> And say, yes, girls, it's fully functional. It it can detect studs. Um, But (laughs) I'll I'll take the fifth on what it did. Um, But they they thought it was awesome. But they they loved the the beeping. They loved the color. But then they took it and they tried to use it as like a checkout device. So they saw it as like, you know, this is fun. This is like going to the store. What do you want to buy? And it would beep. And, and they had a great time. But now if you were to take that stud finder and you were literally to try and use it as a checkout device, 
you would be disappointed. You'd say, this is the worst checkout device I've ever had. It won't scan these barcodes. The price doesn't come up on the screen. I can't. And then somebody would obviously say, well, it's not meant for that. If you want to find studs in the wall or in person, then it's great for that. <laughs> uh, it'll work really, really well for that. But if you use it for something outside its purpose, it's not going to work that great. And here's what happens. We try to make our lives function outside of what they were created for, and it doesn't work. And some of us might be miserable today because we're trying to live life without these priorities, without growing in our love for God, without trying to love others well. And so what happens is, is we are, we are miss aligned. And Jesus says, this is, this is the clarity that our lives need. Now, here's what also is cool about this, is that if this is what we are created for, then it also means that we can have real meaningful moments every single day. That every single day, I can grow in my love for God. If I'm trying to, if I'm, if I'm focused on that, that ordinary moments in life can have deeper meaning when I'm trying to think about them in terms of growing in my love for God. I love what Mother Teresa says. She says, if you can't do great things, do small things with great love. And when we do that, we're growing in the focus that God has for us. Now, if this is what matters most, then here's what it means. Then our two overarching problems in life are misdirected or disordered love and underdeveloped love. Those are our two greatest problems. If the, if the greatest command is to love God with everything and love others as ourselves and to have that order— then our greatest problem is misordered love, disordered love, or underdeveloped love. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. When our loves get out of order, it creates a lot of brokenness and pain in our lives. In other words, when I don't love God first, but God becomes third or fourth or fifth on my list, then guess what? that creates a lot of problems. When I love maybe myself first and my career second and my spouse third and God fourth, that's, that's going to create some really dangerous misalignment. And so our problem is disordered love. One of my favorite movies of all time, don't judge me on this, is The Godfather. I love it. I, Pray for me. Um, but it, it's actually, it actually has, believe it or not, it actually has a lot of spiritual lessons to it. And <laughs> let me make an argument for this. And the, the Godfather, it, it follows the story of this mafia family. See, I first got intrigued in it because I, my mom's dad was a mafia guy. I never really knew him, but I always kind of heard some stories, so it intrigued me. But anyway, um, so the Godfather is about this, this family, the Corleone family, and they're a New York mafia family. And in the beginning, it centers on the youngest son named Michael Corleone. And he knows his family is into bad stuff, and he wants nothing to do with it. He wants to live a healthy life, a non-corrupt life, and he wants to get married with the love of his life and build a family and just be away from everything that his family is. And at the beginning, his priorities are right. Yes, all this power and greed is evil, and a better life is with apart from that, and his, his loves are ordered in a healthier way. But through the story, he gets pulled into the family, and he's like, all right, I'm just going to help for a time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it all legitimate. And all the, the evil stuff that happens, I'm going to change it and make it good, which again is, is a much better motive. But by the end of the story, he becomes totally corrupted by it. 
And by the end of the story, he loves the power and greed even more than his own family. And it ends up ruining his family. And it's the story of what happens to us as human beings is that the wrong, we love the wrong things too much. That, that our souls, if we're not careful, they can become corrupted by that and disordered by that. And it creates a lot of pain. And when you love God first, when God is the great love of our life, it orders things in the way that they should be. And so how do we grow in our love for God? That's what I want to talk about in these moments. How do we grow? If, if loving God first is the most important thing, how do we grow in it? Well, here's number one. You need to know no one is more worthy of your love and devotion than God. No, no one is more lovable than God. No one is more enjoyable than God. I was at a breakfast a couple weeks ago, and someone asked me a really great question. He said, tell me about your kids in one or two words. Tell me who they are in one or two words. I was like, that's a really cool question. And so I thought about it real quick, and I said, well, Emery is, is sweet and gentle. Has a very sweet and gentle spirit, very much like her dad. Um, very, I don't know why you're laughing at that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, those were the words that came to mind. And I thought, Abby, I thought, Abby is very strong and determined. Um, you know, she kind of knows what she wants. She um, is strong-willed, you know, uh, very much like her mother. Um, and, uh, and then I thought, Teddy, I said, well, honestly, Teddy's too young. I can't really tell yet, you know. Um, but it was an interesting thing. And, and it just kind of, it brought out some of the qualities that are so lovable about them, that are so attractive about them. And when you think about God, God has an infinite amount of qualities that make him great. That the, the, if, if my love for God is not there, or maybe it's, it's weakened, or maybe it's, it's kind of cold, the problem is not, is God great and lovable? The problem is something inside of me. You with me on this? God is worthy of being loved with the, with the wholeness of who we are. He is that good. He is that great. He is that perfect. And when I struggle in my love for him, it's not reflective of, well, God isn't really that lovable. It's something disordered or underdeveloped, underdeveloped in my soul. You with me on this? And so the first thing I need to realize is no one is worthy of our love and devotion than God. Here's the second thing. We need to pray for God to help us, to teach us to love him and enjoy him. Thursday night, I talked about Psalm 37, and it says this, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. To me, that is such a powerful psalm, because here's, here's what I know. I believe the second part, we all want the desires of our heart fulfilled. Is that fair? We, we all want our hearts to, to feel satisfied. We all, we all want, there's things that are deeply important to us. Maybe we can't even articulate them, but, but we want them accomplished. We all want that, but usually we don't approach that with the first part of this psalm. It says, here's the way to a fulfilled heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord in the Lord. Enjoy God. Not just his gifts, not just the, the things that he blesses our lives with, but enjoy God himself. Now, when I think about this psalm, and if I'm honest with myself, I know how to enjoy a lot of things in life. We, were, we took the girls to uh, the pool this week, and it was our first time out there, and they just had a ball. It was a beautiful day. The sun was out. They, they were so, like, giddy, excited. And there was a couple moments where I just kind of stepped back, and I was just like, man, this is, this is just so awesome to see their joy. 
And this, this is just such a blessing to see them thrilled and excited. And it was just this beautiful summer evening. And, and I, it, it, I knew how to enjoy that moment. I knew how to enjoy my family. I knew how to enjoy the summer evening. But church, do we not know how to enjoy the presence of God? See, I need to learn how to do that. I need God to teach me. I need God to help me because, believe it or not, at the end of the day, the more that you and I actually enjoy God, the healthier our soul becomes and the more we glorify him. There's a great author, John Piper, he says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And I want you to think today for a moment, what does your relationship with him what is it marked by? If our relationship is marked by just a sense of duty, all right, Lord, I'll come to church because I don't want to get in trouble. All right, Lord, I'll, I'll pray because I'm, I'm scared not to. See, our, our relationship with God is meant to be marked not by obligation, not by duty, but by delight. Because when, I, when I'm delighting God, it means that I actually love him. I actually enjoy who he is. Right? Married people, if you go up to your spouse and you're like, well, I'm here because I have to be. That's not going to go well, amen? It's just, it's just not going to go well. You're like, I, I, I got to live here with you. I got to do these things. I got to... I got to be your husband or your wife. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a great marriage. No. You, you want it to be marked by delight. Now, there's going to be days where it's not. But hopefully that's growing. Hopefully there's moments of that. Hopefully the, the relationship is on a better path. And, and our relation with God is met, not meant to be this cold, duty-oriented, white-knuckle, obligated thing. It's meant to be joy, that we learn to enjoy God and to truly love him and to want to be around him. So we need God's help. We need to pray for it. Here's the third thing. I love this from C.S. Lewis, that one of the ways we grow in love is we learn to follow all the rays of the sun back to the sun. Here's what he meant by that. That we follow all of God, all the rays of God's gifts back to him. But C.S. Lewis says, but don't just stop at gratitude. Where you say, God, thank you for this gift. Now that's a good thing to do and a, and a great practice. But he says, but aim for something deeper than gratitude. Aim for adoration. And this is what adoration is. Adoration is looking at this gift and thinking, what kind of God would provide this gift to me? What kind of God, what must God be like that he would bless me with this gift? Adoration is then thinking about the gift and thinking about the God who is behind it and what he must be like to give this great gift. Like if you maybe you, you look at a great sunset this summer and you're just looking at the clouds and the colors and the sun. You're like, man, this is just stunningly beautiful. Gratitude is just saying, man, thank you, God, for this. But adoration is thinking, what kind of God must be behind a sunset like that? Well, he must be immensely powerful. He must be very detail-oriented. He must value beauty. And art. He, he, must, he must like to, to just give his very best in the order. It, it just takes you to a different place. You with me on this? And, and it nurtures love for God. Here's the fourth thing. Turn from all the empty places that we've been trying to satisfy the thirst of our soul and turn towards God. Here's what our problem is. Disordered love. I'm, I'm looking to something to fulfill me that only God can give me. You ever done that? I'm looking to a person. I'm looking to an addiction. I'm looking to an unhealthy habit. And I'm looking to it to fill my soul, but in a way only God can. Here's what Jeremiah says. 
powerful verse. He says, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cistern for, cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah says, God is like this perfect spring. That there, there's, there's just this bubbling, cold, refreshing water. It doesn't have any fluoride in it or anything like that. It's just, it's just perfect uh, in every way. And it's abundant. It's, it's never ending. He said, God, God is like that to our, our souls. It says, but instead of going to that fountain of living water, we go to this muddy puddle over here with a dead cat in it. And we say, ah, that looks better to me. And there's nasty little bugs, and there's oil, and there's a dead cat floating around. And we're like, okay, which one should I choose? I'll choose this one. And there's this perfect fountain over here. And, and that's what sin ultimately is. It, it's forsaking the fountain of living water, and it's settling for something that is far less joyful and good for us and healing. You with me on this? In all, in all of our lives, we all have things that we go to. And, and we're looking for them to fill our souls. But what we need reminded of is only God can do that. And here's the last thing. I need to remind and teach my soul, God is the treasure, delight, happiness, and joy of my life. Here's the truth. If, if I lost all God's blessings, but I still had God, I have more than enough. You with me? Now, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard truth for our souls to accept. But that's how good God is. That's how satisfying he is. That, that if, if I have him, if you and I have him, we have everything. We have all that we need. We have all that we could, we could ask for. We have all that we could want. And I need reminded of that. Because every day I can draw from that well. Every day I can live from that treasure. Every day I can, I can live from the strength of that. But my soul forgets it real quickly. How about you? Here's a, a psalm that... Uh, I've been just repeating to myself as I've been thinking about this. Whom have I in heaven but you? Look at this next line. There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. That's a healthy soul right there. There's nothing I desire. Yes, Lord, I, I thank you for your gifts. I thank you for these blessings, and I'm going to be grateful, and I'm going to adore you, and I'm going to worship. But Lord, what I really am after is you. Church, can I be honest with you? Sometimes our problem is we only know how to use God. We don't know how to delight in him. When I was growing up, I had a neighbor, and we had a, a pool at our house, and he would come over and knock on the door. He was a little bit older than me. So I kind of looked up to him and thought he was cool. And he would say, hey, can we go swimming? And if I said yes, he would hang out with me. If I said no for some reason or another, he'd just go back home. And even as a young kid, I was like, this relationship doesn't quite feel right. Because uh, he was just using me for the pool. Um, and you know what, church? How often... Are we just using God for his blessings? To say, all right, Lord, if you give me what I need, I'll praise you. I'll be with you. I'll serve you. But Lord, if you don't give me what I need, I'm going back home. I'm taking my ball and going home. I can't go to the pool. I'm out of here. And church, God deserves better than that. He is worthy. Here's what the psalm says. There's nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So here's my prayer for you. And here's what I want to ask you to pray about. This summer, let's ask God to help us to learn to delight in him. Today, if you're looking honestly at your heart and you're like, okay, 
my heart, I delight in all this other stuff way more than I delight in God, then church, let's acknowledge that and let's ask God to help us to grow in our love for him. That's the beginning point of everything. That's the beginning point of every good change in our life is fanning the flame of love for God. And would you be praying that in your heart? And I'll be praying that in my heart. And let's see what God does through us. Now, one last thing I want to share with you. And I just want to remind you, love for God begins with God. It begins with God. Our son, Teddy, he's, he's eight months now. It's going fast. And, uh, and you know, for parents, you, you know, like, it takes a, a few weeks or a couple months before the baby starts smiling at you, you know? Um, and, uh, and that was something I never knew until we had our first kid. I was like, why, why do they always look grumpy? And I was like, well, you know, it takes time for them to smile. I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, you learn a lot on the journey, you know? Um, and, uh, but, but with Teddy, you know, I knew that. And, and of course there is, I'm sure, a biological explanation for it, a physiological explanation for it. But I like to think about it this way. I like to think about, you know, that in a sense, maybe as parents, you awaken that love in them. Because, you know, when they, when they come out of the womb, what do you do? You're just smiling all over them. You're looking at them, and you're smiling, and you're laughing, and you're, and you're, just, you're just showering them with all the love in your heart. And so are the people around them just smiling. But, then, but it takes a while before they begin to reciprocate. And I think it's maybe not just biological, but it's also spiritual. That it's a picture of how God relates to us. See, now it's a fun season. Teddy's smiling all the time. He's rocking that do, man. Outdoing dad. Um, but it's fun. Now he smiles all the time. But here's what 1 John says. It says, we love because he first loved us. I wonder how long God has been smiling at us. How long he's just been, been showering us with love so it would awaken love in our hearts. That's a powerful picture to me. And I want you to know today that if you love God, it's because he first loved you. It's because he's been doing that for longer than we might know. And he continues to do that. And let's just take a moment and let's just invite God's grace and love into our lives. Not just to receive it, but so we can better reciprocate it back to him. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you, Lord, that your love, our love for you, begins with you. That it is deeper than the fragility of our own hearts. It's grounded in the consistency and reality of who you are. Father, I pray today, Lord, that you could just grow our love for you. Father, I'm sorry that like the people in Jeremiah's time, I go and I look to these other places to delight in, to satisfy my soul. When, Lord, I've lived long enough to know that you are the fountain of living waters and there's nowhere else I need to go. So, Father, help us to live that out. Help us to drink deeply from the greatness of who you are. Help us, Lord, to have a relationship with you that is not marked by duty and obligation and distance, but help us to live a relationship with you that is marked by delight and joy and passion. Father, where our love for you has grown cold this morning, I pray you could warm it with your presence. And Father, I pray this summer we could truly see growth in our soul. We could see a new desire, a new passion, a new longing for you, different than we've ever had before. And I pray it would honor you. 
Help us in all this in Jesus' name. Amen.